It seems incredible that all of life on Earth comes from the information held in a single kind of molecule. How can this sort of complexity and beauty be mere chemistry? Yet, why not? Particularly if the chemistry is also very complex. One molecule alone, DNA, has the capability to carry the information, to copy itself into new individuals, to control the other molecules of life, and to change over time into all the strange variations which we see as life on Earth. DNA is possibly the most complex molecule in existence. Stored in a cell nucleus, it is wrapped around proteins which in turn wrap around themselves and fill the nucleus with their threads, called chromatin. But even through a microscope, DNA is mostly invisible, and you generally have to stain the nucleus to see it as small dark chromosomes. On the other hand, you can take it out of the cell and see it face to face. Actually, extracting DNA isn't difficult. Basically, what you have to do is break down all of the rest of the cell so that what you're left with is the DNA. These are white blood cells, and I'll burst them open with this salt solution, which contains some detergent. The detergent attacks the lipid membranes and destroys them, but DNA is wound around protein, so my next step is to get rid of the protein. This enzyme will break all the protein down and I need to incubate it in a 56 degree water bath for several hours. Next, we have to get rid of any solids by centrifuging the tube so that all of the solids go to the bottom. Now let's see what we have got. We have a pellet in the bottom, which is unwanted. It is the clear solution above the pellet that contains the unprotected DNA. DNA is a very long molecule, and I have to handle it carefully, as it is quite fragile when unprotected in the cell. DNA comes out of solution in alcohol. So now, I am going to layer on some cold alcohol and the strands should become visible. DNA is a long, stringy tangle. So what does this stringy stuff actually do in a cell? The answer is that it's simply a store of information. Locked away in the nucleus, it's like a quiet library in a busy city. The real activity of a cell is outside the nucleus. Out in the cytoplasm, metabolism goes on apace. You can see this busy activity in many cells. The cytoplasm is run by proteins. Proteins are the molecules which roll up their sleeves, so to speak, and get things moving. Proteins, as enzymes, promote activity, usually speeding things up more than a million times. Enzymes set reactions going sometimes extremely fast. But if the enzyme is missing or blocked, as here with a muscle relaxant, the activity is stopped. It switches off. Each enzyme, and there are thousands working simultaneously, catalyzes its own specific reaction. Surprise acting as enzymes offer a very precise control mechanism. How can they do this? Proteins, not surprisingly, are polymers, huge molecules made up of repeating parts called monomers. The monomers of protein are amino acids, and life uses 20 different kinds. Depending on the way these 20 amino acid building blocks are put together, Proteins can assume a huge range of shapes, sizes, and functions. There are thousands of enzyme proteins, as well as proteins for other jobs. 
Collagen binds skin and flesh. In blood, hemoglobin carries oxygen. Actin and myosin move muscles. The list goes on. Proteins, like DNA, are contenders for the title of the most complex molecules we know. So what is the link between the proteins in the cytoplasm and the DNA hidden in the nucleus? DNA is a polymer made of monomers called nucleotides. Nucleotides come in four varieties, with bases labelled A, G, C and T. So does the order of these bases on a DNA strand reflect in any way the order of the amino acids in the proteins? It couldn't just be one to one, because four bases can't equal 20 amino acids. But what if the connection was two bases to one amino acid? That would allow a base code of four times four combinations, but 16 is still short of 20. Three to one? Four times four times four is 64 combinations, which is more than enough. In fact, it allows for multiple coding, something we use in language all the time. For example, the words stop, cease and terminate are different ways of giving just one message. Similarly, the base letters of DNA taken in groups of three were found to make 64 words that more than adequately covered the 20 amino acids. So the link is a code. DNA's job is to store a triplet code for making proteins. That's right, DNA codes for protein, and we can show this visually. We've all heard of the firefly and its ability to glow in the dark. Well, it does this by a protein called luciferase. Now, if we take the DNA or gene that codes for luciferase and put it into, for example, a plant, we can make the plant glow in the dark. And here we have an example of how we did this. Here we have our plant seedlings which have the luciferase gene put in them. These plants, when viewed under a special camera, we can indeed show that they do glow in the dark like a firefly. So this glow shows that the DNA has got into the plant and is producing an active protein. In other words, here's a visual example that proves the connection between DNA and protein. But how does DNA actually make the connection? Because proteins are not made in the nucleus. The sites of protein synthesis are outside the nucleus in the cytoplasm. Protein is made on the ribosomes which show up as dark specks on the endoplasmic reticulum and also freely drifting in cytoplasmic fluid. DNA is held and protected in the nucleus and makes no contact with ribosomes. So how does DNA get its message out? As a messenger. It's a molecule very similar to DNA, another nucleic acid, ribonucleic acid, or RNA. While DNA is a double strand, RNA usually occurs as a single. RNA is slightly different from DNA in its sugar ring, ribose. And while it has the same A, G and C bases, T is replaced by uracil, or U. So the code letters of RNA are A, C, G and U. DNA uses RNA as its messenger. To send a message, the DNA partly unzips and the enzyme binds to a start or promoter sequence, which identifies the correct DNA strand to copy. One by one, just as when DNA copies itself, the complementary bases are attracted and assembled. However, this time, courtesy of this enzyme, the nucleotides make RNA not DNA. C still attracts G, but now A attracts U. And instead of creating a new DNA helix, the RNA peels away, getting longer and longer. Here you can see many strands of RNA coming off a single DNA sequence. Numerous molecules of the RNA copy enzyme, RNA polymerase, chase each other along the DNA, 
and a strand of RNA spools off each one, like a photocopy printing out. The information in each copy is the RNA code for a specific protein, which may be hundreds of amino acids long. When the enzyme runs onto a terminator sequence, it releases and the DNA zips up again. The strand of RNA, which now drifts off, carries the instruction of a single gene. The messenger RNA then slips out of the nucleus and soon attaches to a ribosome. Here on the endoplasmic reticulum, or freely floating in the cytoplasm of the cell, these small dark particles are where the protein will be made. The translator is another version of RNA called transfer RNA. Molecules of transfer RNA drift around carrying an amino acid on one end of them and the matching code letters for it at the other. Held by the ribosome, messenger RNA attracts transfer RNA. When messenger RNA code bonds correctly onto transfer RNA anticode, the ribosome grabs the amino acid and shuttles along the messenger RNA to the next three-letter group. So, the ribosome assembles the growing chain of a protein. As you can imagine, this is a summary of a complicated piece of chemistry. But the big picture is, a DNA gene sequence is transcribed as a strand of messenger RNA, which then goes to the ribosomes where, using transfer RNA, the message is translated into proteins. Thus, proteins are made on the instructions of the DNA. We have learned to read the genetic code, and here it is, expressed as RNA code groups, called codons. AAA, or AAG, means the amino acid lysine. AGA, or AGG, are codons for arginine. Leucine has six alternative codons for it. Tryptophan has but one. It's a universal genetic code used by all life, past and present. One way to read the DNA code is this. First, we amplify it using the polymerase chain reaction. And what we have now are millions of identical DNA strands. Next, we add some fluorescent tags to it. When one of these tags binds onto the DNA, it stops the copies from proceeding any further. And if you like, it's like a wrong-shaped brick that gets inserted into the helix and stops the copying process. Now we'll put it back into the PCR and replicate it again. It is completely random when a DNA strand picks up a tag and gets its copying process stopped. And at the end of this reaction, we'll have many DNA strands of different sizes, each one with a fluorescent tag attached to the last base. As you can see here, we have used red for A, green for G, blue for C, and yellow for T. When you separate the DNA on a gel like this and read the bands from bottom to top, then the color of the tags will give away the order of the code. Because this gel can only separate up to 800 bands, for this reason we use pieces of DNA no larger than 800 bases or so. But DNA can be an enormously long molecule, millions of nucleotides long storing enough information in its base sequences to control the entire chemistry of a living organism. It is carefully copied from generation to generation so that offspring are replicas of their parents. Or are they? DNA may be the universal code, but what it writes is a constantly changing story.